Hi guys, I hope you're doing well today. Um, so we're gonna do today's lesson via video. So first thing I want you to do is your warm up and I want you to complete the questions on page seven and I want you to just read them from your notes but don't actually write them in your notes yet. Um, instead record your answers on your warm up sheet. So I'll go ahead and give you two to three minutes to do that and then um, we will begin. All right, so I'm going to stop you guys there. Um, even if you're not done, just go ahead and pass the warm-up sheets forward. And then let's look at the homework from last night before we go over the answers from the warm-up. So I'm going to flip back in our notes. And you should be at the bottom of page, or the top of page five. Um, so last night's homework, you had these two proofs to do. So when we're looking at this first proof, you were trying to prove that alternate exterior angles were congruent, and you start with parallel lines. So if you look at my diagram here, I started with my two parallel lines, and I numbered one pair of alternate exterior angles as 1 and 2. And then in order to get from angle 1 to angle 2, the first thing I did was a rotation of 180 degrees to map onto this blue angle. And then from there, I did a translation of the blue angle to map onto the green angle. So if you look at my proof here, I started with the two parallel lines. Then I took each of the red points, A, B, C, from angle 1. I rotated them around point B 180 degrees. And remember, rotation um, using, you could just write a rotation of 180 using um, center B or around point B. And then for step 3, I did a translation here, so I took each of these points and I translated them along this vector V. So you can draw your vector V here, off to the side here, it doesn't really make a difference, just make sure that you have it labeled. And a translation, your reason for that, translation along vector V or translation along the same vector, however you want to word it. And then for step 4, I show that I mapped the red angle. ABC onto the blue angle, which then got mapped onto the green angle. And this is because if you rotate and translate angles, you're going to map onto another angle. And then that proves that these two angles have to be congruent because I just mapped angle ABC onto angle A double prime, B prime, C double prime. So I essentially, I mapped angle 1 onto angle 2 using rigid motions. So therefore I can say that the two angles are congruent because two figures are congruent if and only if one or more rigid motions maps one figure onto the other. So then example four was a little bit different because this time you have to prove supplementary. So if you look, you start with your parallel lines, same diagram. Um, I'm starting with lines L and M being parallel, and I'm trying to prove same side interior angles are supplementary. So if you look, those are my angles 1 and 2, same side interior, and I'm trying to prove that they're supplementary. So in order to use transformations to do this, 
first thing I do is I take this angle one, this green angle, and I do a translation to map it down onto angle three. Now if I translate angle one, it's not going to map onto angle two. So what I do is I translate it down to angle three, and then since angle one and angle three are congruent, and now angle three and angle two form a straight line, that means that those two angles have to be supplementary. And since angle three is the same thing as angle one, that tells me that one and two are also supplementary. So look at how I wrote this up. So I have my translation, ABC became A prime, B prime, C prime. Translation along vector V or translation along the same vector, however you're going to word it. And then I take and I mapped angle ABC onto A prime, B prime, C prime because translations map angles onto angles. So you don't have to write the translation or rigid motions. You can just say translations map angles onto angles. And then from there, I can say, well, that means that those two angles are congruent. So angle one and angle three are congruent because two figures are congruent if and only if a rigid motion maps one figure onto the other. And then the other statement that I can make is that angle two and angle three are supplementary because they form a straight line. So I write angle two is supplementary to angle A prime, B prime, C prime, which is our angle three, because angles that form a straight line are supplementary. And then my goal, though, was to show that angle two and one are supplementary or angle two and angle ABC, because those are the same side interior. But if you look at steps four and five here, um, in step four, I say that these two angles are equal. A prime, B prime, C prime is equal to ABC. So that allows me to basically replace or substitute angle ABC in for A prime, B prime, C prime. So I go ahead, I substitute it in, and that gives me my final statement. The reason for that is just substitution. I just substituted something in that was equal. So that's that example. Um, this will be up on my website too, so feel free to grab the completed copy from there as well if you need to. And so the other example, depending on what period you're in, um, I believe we finished it. The only thing maybe you had to go in and write, for example, or for the step four, is that statement that we always write. Two figures are congruent if and only if a rigid motion maps one figure onto the other. Um, so just make sure that you have that in there. But the other part of the proof we pretty much did together. So now let's bounce back to that warm up, which was on page seven. So first thing is talking about congruent. We've been talking about it a lot. What does it mean for two figures to be congruent? It means that they have to have the same shape and same size. So how do we know if two figures are congruent? If they have to be the same shape and same size, how do we get that? So first situation here is asking, is it possible for two figures to be congruent if all of the corresponding angles and sides are congruent? So what that means is if I have, let's say I draw two rectangles here, and all of the corresponding angles, so all of the angles that match up, so those two angles are in the same position, these two angles, these two angles, and these two angles, those are all congruent then all of the corresponding sides. So these two sides are corresponding, so those have to be congruent. Those two sides are corresponding, so those have to be congruent. Notice that I use single slash marks here because opposite sides and rectangles are congruent. And then double slash marks now because these two sides correspond and those are congruent. And then these two sides correspond and are congruent. So Basically what this is saying is if all of these markings are true, meaning all of the corresponding angles and all of the corresponding sides are congruent, are the figures congruent? And the answer to that is yes, they are. Everything's exactly the same shape and size. So the next possibility is saying, well, is it possible to be congruent if sides are congruent, but the angles are not? So look at this example here. If I have a square, with four equal sides, and then I have a rhombus, which is almost like thinking of it as like a slanted square, 
that's made up of the same side lengths, are these two figures congruent? The answer is no, because the angles aren't the same, so therefore these aren't the same shape. Um, another scenario here, what if we had a rectangle? So these two sides would be congruent to each other and these two sides are congruent. What if I think of it as slanting that, making it a parallelogram? So those two sides there are the same length as these two shorter sides, and then the two sets of longer sides are congruent, but overall the figures are not congruent. So if the angles are not congruent, but even though the sides are, the figures may not be congruent. So that's kind of what we're getting at here. And then number three here, well, what happens if just the angles are congruent, but the sides aren't? So here's an easy example. If I have a rectangle, four right angles, and a square, four right angles. The angles are congruent. All of them are 90 degrees that correspond, but the sides are not. So overall, the two figures aren't. So this leads us to this key idea number three, that if all corresponding angles and sides of two figures are congruent, then the two figures are congruent. So we basically have two key ideas now. In order to be congruent, all of the pieces have to be congruent, all of the sides, all of the angles. And then we have the other idea that rigid motions will get us congruent figures. So rigid motions meaning reflections, translations, and rotations. As long as one of those, one or more of those have occurred, that means that our two figures are congruent because basically all of the angle measures and side lengths were preserved, meaning all of the corresponding angles and sides are still congruent. So what we're going to look at now is kind of thinking about that whole idea of transformations. We're going to talk about determining if two figures are congruent. So we're going to eventually look at proofs of these in the next section, but for today we're just focusing on are these figures congruent? Meaning, can you find a rigid motion that's going to map one figure onto the other, preserving all of the side lengths, preserving all of the angle measures, keeping all sides and all angles that correspond congruent? Because in order to be congruent, all of the sides and all of the angles have to stay congruent. So I'm going to do the first couple examples with you, and then I want you guys to finish this up on your own. So just a reminder, rigid motions, let's just write it up top here because that's really what we're looking at. So rigid motions are reflections, translations, and rotations. And by doing one or more of these rigid motions, you're going to keep the same side lengths and the same angle measures, creating congruent figures. So when we go to do this, we want to determine was there one or more rigid motion that occurred to get from one figure to the other. So if you look at this first example, it's asking us, is this quadrilateral QRST congruent to quadrilateral UVWX? Well, if they're congruent, that means that there has to be one or more rigid motions that occurred. So our goal is to identify what rigid motion specifically happened. Especially since this is on a coordinate plane, we can be very specific. We can actually give the rule for the rigid motion. So the first, or like the clue kind of to do this, some of you might be able to just look at this and see what happens. Um, but a good kind of hint is to check the orientation. So if you check the orientation, that'll tell you a lot about what kind of rigid motion occurred. So for example, if you have the same orientation, so remember orientation is like the order of the letters around the figure. So same orientation means that um, a translation or a rotation occurred. So a translation or a rotation occurred. Because translations and rotations are going to keep orientation. Where if the orienta um, orientation changes, 
then that means, so different orientation means that a reflection had to occur. Because the only time that the orientation is going to change is, is, is if a reflection occurred. So different orientation means a reflection occurred. So if we check the orientation, remember you want to look at the order of the letters. So really keep this order when you draw in your arrows. So Q to R, R to S, S to T, and then back to Q. So I just went in order with these. So then for this, I'm going to do the same thing. U to V, V to W, WX, and X to U. So if you look at the order, it's the same. The arrows go in the same direction. So this tells me same orientation. which means that it had to have been a translation or a rotation. So now you have to decide, did the figure turn or did it just slide? So when I'm looking at this, I just see the figure just sliding. It didn't turn because it's exactly in the same direction. So translation occurred, so now we have to figure out, well, how? So how did I go from, let's say, point R down to point B, the two points that correspond. So we had to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So right six units, and then down one, two, three. So that tells me the translation that occurred was right six, meaning positive six, down three, negative three. So are these figures congruent is what the question asks. Yes, the figures have to be congruent because a rigid motion mapped one figure onto the other. So yes, because a translation of six negative three maps one figure onto the other and translations Our rigid motions. Now this is not a proof. Okay, we're going to look at the proofs in the next section. This today is just about can you figure out a rigid motion, one or more rigid motions that got one figure to the other, and if you can, then yes, the figures have to be congruent. So you just have to write kind of like a reason like this. Today the focus is really can you come up with the the rule? That's what we're looking for. So coming up with this is really our goal for today. So let's try a couple more examples together. There should be an S there. So example two, um, looking at these two quadrilaterals, are they congruent? So let's check the arrows first. So start at Q, go to R, then go to S and T, then back to Q. Then go over here, start at U, draw an arrow to V, then V to W, W to X, and then X back to U. So when you look at the order here, so this one is going to the right. This one is also going to the right. So that tells me again, same orientation. So that means that this had to have been a translation or a rotation. So when I look at this, the figure definitely turned because T was kind of facing to the left and now it became X, which is up top. So it had to have been a rotation. You can't turn a figure with a translation. So this tells me that there's a rotation. So then if you couldn't figure out where the center of rotation is. Remember, you could actually construct the perpendicular bisector between any two sets of pre-image and image points, and then where those perpendicular bisectors cross, that's going to be the center. But a lot of the times, you can just kind of um, see it. So here, the center, and typically the center is going to be at the origin, so that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Check the origin and see if it looks like it works. So if I compare point S to W, those are the two that match up because they're in that same position when I write the congruence statement here. 
So if you look at the angle that's formed and look at the distance, this was over 1, up 4, this was up 1, over 4, that tells me that the distance here is the same, which means the center is really at the origin. And then you look at this um, angle. This would be a 90 degree angle. So that means I had to turn this figure 90 degrees. Now, depending on which figure we're starting with, so let's say I'm starting with this figure since it's on the right or on the left here. That means I'm going to turn it 90 degrees counterclockwise. So how did I get from the original to the second one? Went 90 degrees. So I did a rotation of 90 degrees. And remember, if it's the origin, you don't have to put 0, 0 first. You can if you want, but you don't have to. So in the end, are these figures congruent? Yes, um, because a rotation of 90 degrees maps one figure onto the other. And rotations are rigid motions. So let's do example three. That'll be our last one together. And then I want you guys to do the rest on your own. So example three, same concept to start. So let's draw our arrows on. So start at A, go to B. Just go around the figure. I'm, remember, I'm following this order here. And then I go to the next one. I'm going to follow this order. So I'm starting at J to M. M to W. W to Y. And again, look at the order. This one's going to the right. This one's going to the left. So we have one going clockwise, one going counterclockwise which tells me different orientation. So if it's different orientation, that tells me that this can only be a reflection. So it's gotta be a reflection. So lowercase r for reflection, or you could just write out the word reflection. So that means I have to figure out, well, what's the perpendicular bisector between any set of pre-image and image points? Because I want to know what line did I reflect over. So remember, reflections are always going to be over lines. So what did I reflect over? So if you compare B to M, those are in the same position here. They're both the second letter. So that means those are the points that correspond pre-image and image. So imagine the perpendicular bisector of this. So this is a horizontal line. It's one, two, three, four, five, six units long. So the perpendicular bisector has to be this line right here, going vertically through the middle of those. You can check any set of points. So the line that I'm reflecting over is the y-axis. So what really occurred here was a reflection, notice lowercase r, over the y-axis. So are these two pentagons congruent? Well, yes. Yes, because um, the re a reflection over the y-axis maps one figure onto the other and reflections are rigid motions. And since we found a rigid motion that maps one figure onto the other, they have to be congruent because all of the corresponding sides and angles are now being preserved, which means overall the figures are congruent. So rigid motions are going to map the figures so that all of the corresponding sides and angles are preserved, meaning that the figures are also going to be preserved and be congruent. So I want you to work on pages 9, 10, 11, um, and figure out are the figures congruent, and then you know write your reason, yes, and make sure that you're giving a specific rule. So when you come into class tomorrow, you want to make sure that you have pages 9, 10, and 11 done. 
because then what we're going to focus on is proving. So you got to have practice with identifying these. So work on those now. Whatever you don't finish will be homework. All right. Have a great rest of the day.